Okay, our second presentation is the 100-year corrosion resistance reinforcement. Mike Stroya yep. with the Commercial Metals Company. Um, he's the marketing manager. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. That's an excellent segue into what I'm going to talk about. Uh, takes some of the uh, duplication out of it. Uh, but again, I'm Mike Stroy with uh, Commercial Metals. We, we do have a booth. We're a national member here. Uh, Lauren and uh, JC are with me. Uh, JC with Chromex and Lauren with Galvabar. So stop by, say hello. But uh, I'll move into our presentations. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on, on Commercial Metals. Uh, we focus on these six things every day, our core businesses, uh, recycling, mill products, uh, fabrication, uh, T-posts, performance, steel, and construction services. But obviously today we're going to focus on uh, the reinforcement portion of it. This is kind of critical to explain who we are in this, and this builds into the types of uh, corrosion-resistant reinforcing. We're vertically integrated. That means we control the product from the source uh, to the field. Uh, so we can provide, we can recycle the steel, go through our mill, uh, supply it and fabrication to the contractor into the field. So we control from point A to the end, end uh, so we have sole source responsibility in these. And that, that becomes really important when we're going to talk about these different corrosion resistant types out there. Uh, here's our footprint, over 167 facilities across the nation. We're building our, uh, we've announced our 14th steel mill in the East Coast. We haven't announced exactly where it's going to be, but it's going to be in the East Coast. And we're building our 13th uh, steel mill in Arizona right now. The, the, the last four of these plants, uh, uh, in uh, Durant, Arizona, uh, Arizona again, and then the East Coast plants will be a new mini mill, mini mill process. So we're actually taking in scrap, continuously feeding the scrap uh, into the melting process and producing rebar continuously. So it's an amazing process and much more efficient if uh, time allows at the end uh, for, for uh, in, the, in the 25 minutes I have, I'll talk, touch a little bit about sustainability and how that's important to the product. Uh, so here, here's the way I'm going to explain the market, and, and they did an excellent job setting that up with Design Life. If you look at supply chain, no matter what you're buying today, right, it's terrible, you know, whether it's a car or anything, well, rebar is not much different. Demand is high, supply is, is not scarce, but some products are more scarce than others. But overall, in two years, if you look at two years, the uh, uh, uncoated reinforcement's probably up anywhere from 40 to 60 percent, depending on what type you're looking at. And the uh, coated reinforcement side is probably up about 30 percent. And that's mostly directly due to the bar costs. Uh, depending on what kind of galvanizing you're buying, uh, there's some increases in the cost of zinc. Uh, and certainly uh, the, the, the more metals in your uncoated reinforcement are, are playing a role in that. That's all that I'll explain. So first off, I'll talk about uh, uncoated reinforcement and your decision factors. And we're talking about a 100-year corrosion-resistant market here. Uh, there's confidence levels, like he said, in different products. But all these products are currently be, being designed uh, for some states in the 100-year life. So stainless steel. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you that stainless steel is not corrosion resistant. I'm not going to do that. It's just it's not true. Uh, but the mostly specified uh, product up there is 2304. You'll get some other versions of it. And certainly there's a myriad of, of stainless steel reinforcement types out there they could do. Uh, but overall, uh, you're looking at uh, uh, something that's really difficult to supply uh, with historical increases. And uh, there's other value opportunities, which, which was explained earlier. And, and it's important to note from stainless steel perspective, they're not integrated with the mills. There's three fabricators in the country that are approved to fabricate. They're not aligned with the mill. They buy from the mill and they speculate on the market. So availability really comes down to a couple of things. It comes down to do they want to sell it at the price they bought it for from the mill? And right now the answer is no. <laughs> They're losing thousands of dollars for every load they ship at the speculation prices that they bought. I'll go into a little detail in, in the Chromex side uh, uh, for uh, those costs of, uh, of materials and why. I'm not saying it's a bad choice. It's a, it's a great choice, and people are choosing it. If you look at the corrosion-resistant market out there, and, and it's kind of the holy grail for corrosion-resistant rebar, 
it's the smallest slice out there. It's, uh, it's 10% or less that people are actually specifying uh, that percentage and that long. Maybe growing a little bit more, and we hope so, but there's uh, other options to consider. A low carbon chromium or Chromex is uh, ASTM A1035 here. Uh, you see down there, and uh, we're specifically talking about uh, the 9100 version. Uh, yes, there is 4100, uh, but it's typically only for a 75-year design life. Uh, not, not saying you couldn't design it for 100 years. You just probably expect more maintenance out of that. Uh, but certainly, uh, the 9% the nine, the 9 chromium 9100 is being specified for that. And, and here's where it's being. Maryland, obviously, uh, excellent uh, segue into that. Uh, yes, we're very happy with our uh, progress in, in Maryland and, and other states, Virginia as well. Uh, but uh, with over a thousand uh, bridges done, it's being used out there. And it's just not just in America, it's North America and Canada as well. So you look at the states to the right, these are all projects that people chose to use uh, Chromex instead of stainless steel. Uh, you know, New York's starting to do that. Uh, you know, you see the MDTEA in there, Hawaii, uh, and some other states as well. Uh, we're in conversations with a lot of people due to the, the market constraints on stainless steel as well. Uh, but because we're uh, integrated into the mill, we can supply this and we can fabricate it in-house or even use independent sources or distributors even to, to furnish it all across the coast. Uh, you look at the two facilities to supply it, it's Cascade out west and CMC uh, in Casey, South Carolina. Uh, so it's really uh, not that much of a different process than our normal steel. They have to do some special things and they do some a heat treating process, but uh, there's uh, just to keep in mind, if you've got a project you're considering uh, Chromex, just it will work within your time frames for those projects. You know. and, and mostly uh, these bigger projects that are being specified, these projects are well planned in advance. Uh, it's not a surprise bit coming out left and right here. Uh, we are getting more requests now for some smaller jobs to replace smaller stainless jobs though. Uh, just looking at the ASTM designation that goes through, and, and again, I don't have time to explain all the details, but you can stop by and uh, say hello to JC and he'll tell you all the details. We have accredited presentations for each one of these uh, topics, including sustainability uh, or lunch and learns. But you know, you can use it to the design strength, which is a whole other uh, feature uh, of grade 100, uh, and it meets exceeds the uh, properties of uh, A615 uh, grade 80 or 100. And, and this is the chemical composition down below there. So uh, this is where we get into the details here. So stainless steel versus Chromex. So when you look at the, the, the original design for stainless, it's designed for a lot of things. Very small percentage actually goes out to rebar versus, versus what they're producing in the marketplace for, for other refrigerator applications and all kinds of things. They wanna make, they wanna make a five foot wide sheet, go on 100 miles an hour and roll form that stuff. Uh, but they're making rebar too. But the cost of chromium, nickel, and molybdenum have gone through the roof. Uh, and that, that has a, a factor in their pricing. So again, they're speculating when they buy it from the mill and then they're uh, reacting when the actual jobs hit place. So when you look at that compared to uh, Chromex, yes, Chromex is in, said increases just like any other bar out there, but the percentages of chromium, nickel, and moly are drastically different. We're only really worried about chromium. And that's, uh, that's uh, even though it's significant, it's a much smaller percentage. And then, you know, that variability has is, is not been there for us. The other thing we can do is look at it as a mill, a steel mill. When we bid prices, we hold the prices. Uh, we, we're holding prices from two years ago for, for some jobs, uh, depending on the size of them. But that's a conversation to have. So I'm sure we'll, uh, we have conversations about the, the pricing and, and the, the changes in, in it and plan it out. Case studies for Chromex, just little details. I'm just going to pop these up here. These are all federally sponsored uh, uh, studies. Uh, you have Kansas at the top there, University of Calgary, uh, University of Akron and Rutgers. Again, JC can touch on each one of these. They have a special case study for each each one of these topics. Uh, the uh, Akron study was a focus on corrosion and, and bond strength, where the other ones are uh, more of a focus on corrosion and, uh, and capabilities and accelerated testing. Uh, the the, the uh, Calgary one was more of a long-term test, which is an excellent example. They like to talk about that. So moving on to coded reinforcement. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with galvanized. Uh, you know, I mentioned that I'm, I'm par partially galvanizing, but I represent CMC. We represent all our products here. 
Continuous galvanizing is, is a relatively new development. Uh, last uh, four or five years we've been developed. Probably basically took a hot dip galvanized product, improved the process, removed the iron from the coating, and, and created a formable uh, continuous galvanized rebar. Uh, its consistency is pure zinc, and that's what's important in galvanized rebar is pure zinc. Uh, it doesn't uh, expand, it's corrosion resistant, and it's very predictable when it's controlled in our controlled process. Uh, so the th thicker pure zinc, and that's, we'll, I'll show you the differences in the coatings, is, is what uh, controls the, uh, the life of the coating, that makes it more predictable. But this supply chain portion of this makes this uh, an amazing product because we can hold it in inventory, we can push it around the country, and fabricators can, and can use it in their shop and design it and, and form it just like Black Bar. Uh, but the other possibility or, or, or thing that you can do with it is make field adjustments, which is very difficult to do with hot dip galvanizing. Uh, with, with the traditional batch hot dip galvanizing, not knocking that product at all. It's actually the longest demonstrated product in service life of out there of any corrosion resistant re reinforcement. It was federally specified in the 50s at one time. Uh, so it's got the longest history of any reinforcement out there. If you look in the uh, NBI database and some of the oldest galvanized bridges, they're doing well. They're doing very well. Uh, there's just a different alternative now to it. Uh, so it's mostly type one, which is you form it and send it to the galvanizing process and then uh, back to the shop and then to the field, uh, uh, but certainly is uh, available regionally, particularly in the Northeast here. Uh, and, and some pockets in the in the southeast and, and Midwest too. Very damage resistant, both galvanized coatings, uh, and it, it designs just like Black Bar. Just real quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the corrosion protection method for galvanizing, but you have a barrier protection and a cathodic protection. So if you scratch it, chip it, or do anything, you have you have protection. There is a chloride threshold limit uh, to that. It's usually double to four times of black steel, but uh, you know, with, with the batch process, you get variable coatings. With the continuous process, we're doing some research on chloride thresholds specifically for the, for the products now. And uh, here's kind of a photomicrograph to, to, to do it, and, and I'll, I'll finish up with a, a study that shows they're basically uh, 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 linear, or you can specify one for the other or interchangeable. Hot dip galvanizing has zinc iron alloy layers. It's batch reliant. So the chemistry of the rebar dictates what the coating structure will be. So you can get a variable thinner, thinner or thicker pure zinc layer on the surface. Uh, the more reactive the steel is, the more that iron will grow to the surface. So you're left with more zinc iron. Uh, iron contributes nothing to any <laughs> corrosion protection system, so it's difficult to predict that. Uh, so if the iron grows to the surface, you're not getting a pure zinc layer. Uh, we're in the 10 fit, 1094 process, we're, we're best we're processing well above the minimums, uh, closer to 70 or 80 microns of, of pure zinc. We have a ternary layer that doesn't allow the iron to go to the surface, so we can control that process. Uh, and then ultimately what happens and what you want to you get to a chloride, uh, you get to a chloride threshold level, and then you have the corrosion protection of zinc. But in that process, it's important to note that the expansion, the expansion of the products for zinc don't uh, cause uh, uh, don't cause stress or compression enough to cause cracking. So yes, you'll get cracks from the surface, but you won't get pro cracks propagating from the bar surface because you don't have that expansion. Eventually, the iron in the hot dip galvanizing will have some stress and compression, where the continuous works more like a an anode and pure a pure zinc anode. But that's kind of the protection method, a typical corrosion model on the left and the galvanized on the right. Bond strength studies, excellent bond strength and lap splice, designed like black bar, like I said. And this is a Kansas study, this is the last slide on the galvanizing before I get to the others. It essentially, it shows you the conventional types of rebar in a two and a half inch cover and a three inch cover. So cheating a little bit, but the three, three inch cover provides a longer life for all coatings. The eventual uh, outcome of this study from Dr. Darwin was use corrosion resistant rebar of any kind. You're going to get a longer service life. You're going to don't use black bar, basically, is what he said. He found that the uh, A767 and A1094 were interchangeable, used the same values for it. Uh, 
uh, and he did find that uh, UV exposed uh, 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 epoxy was was going to last in life. But you look at the repair cycles in these over a hundred year life of these, and you have different variations in there. One repair in a two and a half inch deck for well, you have a repair in year 100, so it's a hundred year service life with one repair in year 50. Even epoxy, they're showing it that uh, so. There's just more repair life in there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on epoxy. It's the most widely specified product out there. It's probably about 80% of the market share for corrosion resistant reinforcement. But you know, if you believe that it's going to last 100 years, I don't have a problem with you saying that. Just plan for maintenance. There's maintenance cycles in design life and in, in service life for sure. Uh, but this is how epoxy works as a, as a coating. I'm mentioning it here because the next phase we're going to talk about dual coated products to consider. But you have electrolyte that gets good coating to the surface and eventually will penetrate, uh, attack the surface. And if there's obviously a pinhole, you have accelerated corrosion there. Uh, those are the concerns with, uh, with epoxy. Uh, dual coated. Uh, it's a little bit different spin for, for you here. I got maybe 10 more minutes. I'm doing pretty good. So this is the option to think about. Look at your steel bar, whether it's A615, A706, uh, either one, or even 1035. You know, so you have options there. You can do a galvanized coating or a top coat. So you can take a, a Chromex with an epoxy. You can do a galvanized uh, Chromex. You can do a, a, a galvanized with an epoxy on top of it, 1055. These are options to consider that are, that are now available. Uh, galvanizing Chromex in the continuous process is, is very easy. Doesn't add a ton of cost either. Uh, putting epoxy on top of uh, our galvanized coating, ASTM A1055, not a problem. Uh, so there's options out there, and they're even for, for dowels, they're doing uh, galvan or, uh, epoxy over Chromex. So there's different options out there to consider uh, to extend the life, to compete against stainless steel. And it would all be cheaper than stainless steel. The benefits, again, the same benefits uh, Stephen went over. You're looking at the uh, service life. Uh, got options for ductility and strength, whether it's 706 and you want to design it in seismic areas. There's not a lot of corrosion-resistant options for, for seismic areas uh, in the West Coast and South Carolina and the East Coast even. There's not that many options for, for, uh, for that ductility and strength. Uh, you have improvements in strength and, and testing for sure. Uh, long life uh, re uh, with the uh, reduction against the cost of stainless and available in this supply chain. Uh, these technologies provide uh, formable coatings that, uh, that can be consistently produced in the field. Uh, there was an earlier version of, of ASTM 1055 that was a metallized and epoxy coated. Very difficult to bend, very difficult to control. But this modern process that, uh, we, we, that we were getting specified in other states is, is a formable coating through any of the uh, epoxy interest group uh, fab shops. So these uh, technologies increase the corrosion resistance through barrier and sacrificial protections. So it's just an option to consider out there. And kind of wrapping up on the corrosion resistance side and the dual coat, you know, the, really kind of going over it, whether it's <clears throat> CGR over Chromex or epoxy over uh, continuous galvanizing, there's options that you can stop by and say hello, and we'll talk to you about those. Uh, but there's uh, a, a evaluation at uh, tra Transit uh, through Texas A&M LSU. This is the way they looked at electrochemical results, and they provided an index. You know, essentially they looked at uh, the galvanized technologies, <clears throat> said a galvanized Chromex is obviously going to be better than a, than a galvanized by itself, and an epoxy coated uh, galvanized is going to be better than, than those two. Epoxy has a little bit of an advantage in accelerated tests, uh, so it came out well, but we expect good life out of all these coatings. I have a couple minutes to just briefly talk about sustainability, but it's kind of a buzzword these days, and nobody really thinks about it in the steel option. Uh, and it's just a real quick throw through for CMC, kind of a promotional thing, but just talking about it, all these steel guys, whether it's Nucor or our product, uh, we're looking at these options uh, for how we are stewards in the, in the industry and how we uh, look at the future. But I want to really say that, you know, the steel recycling that we do and the uh, steel production, this is a circular economy. So it goes from cradle to grave. We take this pretty seriously. Uh, we uh, uh, promote use, reuse. 
and and when we look at it we we can talk about these things uh, our scrap based uh, EAF processes not even that, that doesn't even include our brand new mills that are even better uh, our co2 emissions there are 63 percent less than the global steel making average uh, and what we do in the United States for steel is way beyond what's better than than done outside this this country and then even you can take a look at this uh, production and compared against other technologies like fiberglass. Fiberglass has a, a very low output and a very, uh, a very low energy. But when you compare that to what we are doing, we're producing way less energy per foot of, of bar produced. Just looking at our goals for what we have for 2030, we're going to reduce our, uh, we're going to reduce our energy consumption by, by more than 5%. We've already been over that right now with the two new mills will probably be even higher. Uh, renewable energy use is uh, is being increased, so we're buying energy credits. Uh, just a little thought out to the future: we may be able to provide carbon-free rebar someday. Uh, and, you know, what value is to that uh, to you? What value is carbon-free rebar in the supply chain? Uh, we can decrease our we can decrease our scope one and two. This is high-level uh, 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 GHG ener energy emission stuff. Uh, but we can also uh, w with reduce our water withdrawal, which is uh, more on the environmental side as well. And, and that's kind of it. Uh, that's uh, everything we've done. Uh, again, uh, any email questions, Galva Bar or Mike, Mike Stroy at CMC or Chromex at CMC for any Chromex questions. JC and Lauren and I will be at the booth over there for commercial models if you have any further questions. But I'll, at this time, I'll take some more. I knew Siva would have a question, of course. <laughs> Yeah. Continuous galvanizing is hot dip galvanizing. No different than the metallurgical. It's a metallurgical bonded steel. It's just zinc without the iron in it. Uh, like automotive steel sheet or uh, Gregory uh, Industries has a continuously galvanized guardrail that's used in every one of the states. They just make it in, in a continuous process. Uh, the, well, a tiny bit of aluminum develops a ternary layer, or iron aluminum zincate that doesn't allow the iron to go to surface. We're preheating and then we're rapidly moving it through so it doesn't have dwell time to, to have that residency to, to, to have that iron go to the surface and then we're rapidly cooling it afterwards. Well, aluminum is just part of the bath. It's just a point, point two, point three percent, very, very small amount, but that's enough to inhibit the iron in the, in the coating. Yeah. Very, we didn't invent the process. Yeah, yeah, we got a video we can show you, but you know, we didn't invent the process. It's the process has always been that we just applied it to rebar. Okay, thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.